Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. Crossover titles between large companies in the world of video games is no new thing. In fact, some of the most popular and some of the most well received games of all time have been crossovers. The likes of Super Smash Bros, the Marvel vs series and even classic franchises like Mortal Kombat have given us combinations of characters in settings and scenarios we never imagined we would see. How glorious! And that's not even mentioning the time that hell basically froze over and we got crossovers between the two fiercest bitter rivals in Mario and Sonic, who were the closest thing gaming ever got to the Bloods and the Crips. So why is it then that the first ever collaboration between two of gaming's biggest, most influential and iconic arcade titans in Namco and Capcom is all but forgotten to the sands of time? Yes, this ambitious crossover actually happened, so join me as I take a deep dive look at this game and the relationship between the two companies as we explore the weird story of Capcom's largely forgotten crossover event. This ladies and gentlemen is the mad story of Namco cross Capcom, a game most of the world never even got. Yeah. Namco cross Capcom would begin development in late 2004 by Monolith Soft, the same Monolith Soft who would later bring to the world the amazing Xenoblade Chronicles games. The development house was made up primarily of former Square employees and were one of Namco's subsidiaries back then. The Namco Cross Capcom game was originally planned to be an in-company crossover made to celebrate 50 years of Namco, featuring all of its most celebrated IPs. Higher-ups at Namco obviously saw great potential in the project, so started dreaming even bigger. The idea was tossed around of expanding the amount of characters and character diversity by reaching out to a second company and using their IPs on this ambitious project as well. The bold move to try and enlist one of the biggest companies in all of gaming was decided upon and the company in question was of course the mighty Capcom. It's worth bearing in mind here that publisher crossovers weren't even really a thing in gaming at this point, and the idea of two companies of this size working together like this was pretty unheard of. Sure, we'd seen the excellent Capcom vs SNK series, but that was more a case of the big boys at Capcom letting the little minnows at the dying SNK have a go on their toys, the merging of two gaming giants that we were getting here. History though was essentially made when Capcom agreed to come on board after one of the most influential men in the company, Kiji Inafune, was very complimentary of the project and praised the initiative that had been taken. The game was announced in January 2005 when production was already around 70% complete and was released on Sony's immensely popular PlayStation 2 console in May of that year. With a practically limitless amount of choices from the massively expanded talent pool, Namco Cross Capcom now featured an absolutely huge array of characters from both companies' rosters. Around 30 from the Namco side and a whopping 35 from the Capcom side. Compromised of IPs from familiar franchises such as Tekken, Soul Calibur, Klonoa, Ghosts and Goblins, Final Fight, and of course Street Fighter, as well as a couple of series that will be less familiar to Western audiences. There were even a couple of original characters made exclusively for the game thrown in for good measure. The only problem was that Namco Cross Capcom was to be a Japan only release, with no real plans to move the game over to the West. Just another example of those greedy buggers in Japan hogging all of the best and weirdest games for themselves. To be fair though, it doesn't seem particularly western friendly in terms of its gameplay. The core mechanic is a rather stripped down and somewhat simplified take on the turn based strategy RPG genre with a bit of a twist. When two or more players are in close enough proximity to each other, the game enters something slightly more akin to a fighting game stage. I'm assuming this is to make the game more closely resemble what one might expect from two publishers so renowned for their one-on-one -on -one fighters. 
During this phase, players have a limited number of moves to attempt to inflict as much damage on their opponents as possible, using simple button inputs. Rather than quarter circle fireball motions and complex combinations, commands are simplified to one direction at a time and the circle button. Although these sections are a major part of the game, the emphasis is still put on the strategy elements, hence the combat simplicity. It's fair to say that Namco Cross Capcom isn't an incredibly deep game, particularly for strategy RPG enthusiasts, but rather the appeal comes from the unbelievable range of characters on offer and all of the mischief the ragtag bunch of rapscallions get themselves into. Speaking of which, another possible reason for no one particularly wanting to bring the title over to us eager western gamers might be the huge amount of text which also makes the original completely unplayable unless you happen to be able to read these extremely difficult to decrypt Japanese hieroglyphics. Luckily for us, there is now fortunately an English language patch created by the lovely folks over at Transgen, who also gave us the fan translation of the classic Kingdom Hearts game Chain of Memories on the PS2. How thoroughly decent of them! To give you some idea as to how much of a bloody pain in the ass these translations are, it took the team over two years to complete the patch, finally seeing the light of day in 2008. So with all of that waffling on in those little text boxes, you'd expect there to be some plot to go along with it, wouldn't you? And you'd be right. Typically with these type of games, it's a bit all over the place and disjointed, but it makes up a big portion of the whole product. The story revolves around interdimensional rifts that are opening up and bringing in entities from other dimensions and more successful games. This is all being investigated by a supernatural task force led by Riji Arisu and Zeamu. Riji and Zeamu then end up teeming with many of the entities that came through the aforementioned rifts in an effort to battle both the evil source of the portals and the combined forces of the villainous antagonists from several of the characters' various respective franchises. Different elements from all of the different gaming universes are incorporated in all sorts of often surprising scenarios, and characters cross over with one another in ways you might not expect. Fan service is pretty much at an all-time high here, so if you're an absolutely massive nerd with an extensive knowledge of all of these gaming franchises in your back pocket, it will certainly help in adding to your enjoyment of the game. Although, obviously none of this will help you in finding you a girlfriend. Namco Cross Capcom ended up being a moderately well received game. Critics weren't exactly wetting their pants with glee and took some issue with the more rudimentary elements of the gameplay and combat systems but on the whole, scores were fairly high. Praise was given to the humorous dialogue and story, as well as the novelty of seeing so many famous characters interact. Similarly, sales weren't anything to get overly excited about, but were solid enough to land it a spot in the top 10 best-selling games in Japan during its month of release, shifting just shy of 120,000 copies which climbed to just over 130,000 copies by the end of the year. Possibly not the astronomical numbers that its execs at Namco had hoped for, but sales were positive enough, and the critical and fan reception was warm enough that it was clear the blossoming friendship between these two companies was worth pursuing, and looked to be developing from short-term bromance into long-term relationship. But would this relationship produce any further gaming offspring? Why, yes! Just three short years later, development reins were handed to the company made up of former Data East employees, Idea Factory, and a spiritual sequel of sorts by the name of Cross Edge was released to the seventh generation powerhouses, the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3 in 2008. Cross Edge was once again a Japanese exclusive, but fear not. For one year later, players from the rest of the world got to enjoy the game when it was released to all other regions. That is, unless you were a 360 owner. In which case, it was tough luck as it remained a Japan exclusive on that system. Poor little Xbox fanboys. As if the Red Ring of Death wasn't enough to worry about. With this one, gameplay shifted to a more of a traditional RPG style, with character progression and random battles and all of the standard JRPG jazz but with many of the story and crossover elements remaining, 
there is another large roster of characters to choose from here, taken from a slightly more diverse range of games and franchises, as well as a higher number of original characters who make up the lion's share of the game's main story protagonists. Critics weren't as kind to this one, with many seeing it as an outdated, clunky and old-fashioned game, with the consensus being that it was a bit of a wasted opportunity. Scores weren't terrible, but the overly convoluted menus, less than cutting-edge graphics and imbalanced gameplay led to mostly reviewer apathy and sales reflecting this. Thankfully, this didn't deter the allied powers of Namco and Capcom from continuing their reign of terror as the next project they ended up working on together became a bit of a classic, and hopefully we don't get sued by Metal Jesus here, because it's also something of, well, a hidden gem. Returning to their fighting game roots and making the type of one-on-one -on -one brawler that most people would have probably expected from these two arcade titans, Street Fighter Cross Tekken was to be the first in a duo of crossover fighting games pitting the most popular characters from the most popular 2D and the most popular 3D tournament fighters of all time against one another in a series of tag team battles players. Released worldwide to PC 7th generation consoles and even some handhelds in 2012, Street Fighter Cross Tekken used 2D gameplay and artwork and character models similar to those found in Street Fighter 4. So essentially Ryu Ken and the gang are playing on home turf. Sadly, the second game in the miniseries was cancelled before development even really took off, but the plan was for it to be called Tekken Cross Street Fighter, and the idea here was to use 3D environments, Tekken movements and controls, and either assets from or character based on art styles taken directly from the Tekken universe, giving the Namco crew their turn for home field advantage. Although it's a great shame that we never got to see how that would turn out, the collaborative efforts between the two companies didn't stop there, and later that same year, or the following year if you live outside of Japan, 3DS owners were treated to Project X-Zone. Acting as more of a direct sequel to Namco Cross Capcom than 2008's Cross Edge, development duties were handed back to our friends at Monolith Soft and gameplay is once again utilising a grid-based RPG system, with a similar battle mechanic to last time. The main difference here is that as well as Namco and Capcom characters, Sega IPs have also been thrown into the mix. Bloody hell! So now we get characters from the likes of Street Fighter, Resident Evil, Tekken, Tales of Vesperia, Sakura Wars and Virtua Fighter, just to name a few. It's almost getting a bit crowded now. Project X Zone also received the highest praise of any of the non fighting game crossovers we've covered today up until this point, with several glowing reviews and a fairly respectable Metacritic score of 70%. The game also had much higher than predicted sales figures, however, that ensured that it was seen as a success and ensured a sequel wouldn't be too far behind which came in the form of 2016's 3DS exclusive, Project X Zone 2. As if fans of this quirky little franchise hadn't been spoiled enough with the last instalment, this time in addition to Namco, Capcom and Sega characters being selectable, they were being given extra guest Nintendo stars to choose from too. I'm pretty sure this franchise continues, we'll start seeing Harry Potter and members of the Star Wars universe rubbing shoulders with Mega Man and Frank West before too long. So at the time of making this video, that is currently the last direct crossover game between these companies, but there is a strong interest and there have been talks about making a third game in the Project X Zone series. Well, fourth if you count the original Namco Cross Capcom, so there's every chance we could see a new iteration sooner rather than later. If you fancy seeing standalone deep dives on the Project X Zone games down the line, be sure to let me know in the comment section. But in the meantime, if you are craving more Namco Cross Capcom video goodness, last year I released a video covering Street Fighter Cross Tekken, so you may fancy checking that one out next. Overall, that just about wraps it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed having a trawl through the history of the rather fascinating romance between two of gaming's biggest hitters, which using the translation patch may even encourage you to potentially want to try out Namco Cross Capcom for yourself, 
It is certainly an overlooked game here in the West that deserves more eyes and attention for what it manages to bring to the gaming table. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the story of Namco Cross Capcom. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like this video, subscribe, hit that notification bell and do all of the usual video things. Videos like this are partially funded by the amazing people who back this channel on Patreon, who I currently have the offer out there to ask me any questions you like to go at the end of these videos. Now there's a few hundred of you who are willing to back this channel at present, so why not make sure you get your question in for next week. In the meantime though, I am in Warsaw and off to shoot the next exciting series of handhelds around the world. So I hope you're all entertained next week by that. Yeah, cheerio.